Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Anbiya wal Mursaleen Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin Amma ba'an All thanks and praise are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And may his peace and blessings be upon his last and final messenger His family, his companions And those who follow them until the end of times Alhamdulillah Yesterday we spent the entire session Talking about verse number 11 in all of the different lessons that we can learn from it and how to try to actually apply it into our daily lives. And inshallah today, we'll be exploring the meanings of verse number 12. Throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions these very broad general values, morals, ethics, and characteristics that we as believers are supposed to embody in our daily lives. And these broad general morals, values, ethics, characteristics and traits are things that we're supposed to use to nurture ourselves, to develop ourselves, to make us human beings and to make us human beings that are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these things they develop and nurture us to be the best human beings as possible. They train us to be morally upright, God conscious individuals. And that is one of the most important things. More important than the form more important than what we look like or how we speak and things like that more important than that is our morality our ethics our character right the way we deal with others the way we care ourselves our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our taqwa and that's why so much emphasis is placed on adab and akhlaq and we learned in the first lesson that one of the names of this surah is what suratul akhlaqi wal adam now in verse 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He guided us towards practical things. Things we can actually do to create an environment, a community of brotherhood, mutual love, respect, and unity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to stay away from three social ills. The first one was as-sukhriya, mockery, making fun of other people. The second one was al-lams, finding faults with one another. And the third was at-tanabuzu bil al calling people insulting or offensive nicknames. These are three sins that are rooted in a person's arrogance and pride. The reason why a person engages in them is because there's a disease in their heart, there's a sickness of arrogance and pride. Thinking they're better than others because of their wealth, their status, their education, their race, their ethnicity, and sometimes even their language. And these are social ills, social evils that lead towards enmity. It leads towards hatred. It leads towards disrupting the community and causing disunity. The next verse, verse number 12, it continues with the same subject matter. It's going to talk about social ills, social uh, evils that we're supposed to stay away from. So the proper manners, etiquettes, and behavior we're supposed to observe when dealing with each other. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اجْتَنِبُوا كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الظَّنِّ إِنَّ بَعْضَ الظَّنِّ إِثْمٍ وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا أَيُحِبُّ أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُوا وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ تَوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ O oh you who have believed, avoid much negative assumption or suspicion. Indeed, some suspicion is sin. And don't spy or backbite each other. Would one of you like to eat the flesh of his dead brother when dead? You would detest it. And fear Allah, indeed Allah is accepting of repentance and is all merciful. This verse, it includes rulings related to mutual rights and manners that are related to our social lives. How we're supposed to interact with one another on a community basis or on a societal level. And just like the previous verse, this verse also has three specific prohibitions. The first prohibition is against su'udhan, having unfounded suspicion. Su'udhan, it means to think bad of another individual for no reason whatsoever. Like I see someone praying and I start questioning their intention. Well, the only reason why he's praying is to show off. And there's no reason for me to think that. Or someone's giving charity, I'm like, oh, the only reason he's giving charity is to show off. The second one is at-tajassus, 
spying. And the third one is al riba backbiting. Now this is the fifth time in the surah, right? The fifth time in 12 verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to us directly again. He's calling out to us, he's addressing us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who have believed. And the reason why again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to us is to grab our attention, to make sure we're listening, to make sure we're paying attention and to listen. So again Allah says, O oh, you who have believed, ijtanibu kathiran min adhan, inna ba'd adhanni itham. Avoid most of suspicion. For surely suspicion in some cases is a sin. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's telling us to avoid and stay far away from dhan. Right, the word used is dhan. And the word dhan, it's translated here as suspicion and sometimes assumption. And it's defined as a level between certain knowledge and doubt. So what exactly does dhan mean? Right, so there's something known as yaqeen. That's absolute knowledge, certain knowledge. And there's something that's known as shak, doubt. And then there's something in between those two which is known as dhan. So dhan, it's a type of thought or a type of knowledge that's not absolutely certain. It could be true and it could be false. Right? It's an assumption that's based on probable evidence. It's based on a person's thoughts, what they think and assume to be right or wrong. So one can be thought of as suspicion or an assumption. So I might assume something about Anas, but that's an assumption that's based just off of my thought. There's no certainty to it. It's not absolutely true. It could be false. And more often than not, assumptions turn out to be what? False. Most assumptions that we make about other individuals, they turn out to be completely wrong. And you literally make a fool out of yourself. It creates misunderstandings, it creates distrust, it creates a lot of issues. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, He's addressing us and He's saying, stay away from most doubts and suspicions. Now the commentators, they mentioned what exactly does that mean? It means stay away from thinking bad about good people. Don't think bad about good people. Individuals who seem to be upright, righteous, and God-fearing. So for example, if someone apparently seems to be good, they're involved in good things, they're studying, they come to the masjid, they give charity, they volunteer their time, then we shouldn't unnecessarily question them or doubt them. We shouldn't unnecessarily question their intentions, nor should we suspect that they're involved in something sinful. Right? Having that type of thought about another brother, another sister is completely impermissible. Right? We're not supposed to think bad of other individuals. This includes having unfounded suspicions about our families. Right? We might think that our children are doing something wrong for no reason whatsoever. For some people, they're very, very jealous of even their own spouse. And they think that their wife is doing something wrong and there's no proof for it. Or wives think that their husbands are doing something wrong and there's no proof for it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying you're supposed to avoid having these types of negative thoughts, these types of negative assumptions. Thinking bad about people, questioning their intentions and sincerity for no reason whatsoever is a sin. Right? As a matter of fact, we're supposed to make excuses for one another and we're supposed to think highly of each other. Right? We're supposed to assume the best of our brothers and sisters. We're supposed to give them excuses. Even if we see them doing something that we think is wrong, we're supposed to give them a what? Excuse. Excuse. Right? If you see someone outside and they're speaking to a sister, you should give them what? Benefit of doubt. Give them these excuses. And there are a number of ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ that mention the prohibition of thinking bad about others. So for example, Abdullah ibn Umar says, قَالَ رَأَيْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَطُوفُ بِالْكَعْبَةِ وَيَقُولُ مَا أَطْلِيَبَكِ وَأَطْلِيَبَ رِيحَكِ مَا أَعْظَمَكِ وَأَعْظَمَ حُرْمَتَكِ وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِ لَحُرْمَةُ الْمُؤْمِنِ أَعْظَمُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ حُرْمَةً مِنْكِ مَالِهِ وَدَمِهِ وَأَنَّ ظُنَّ بِهِ إِلَّا خَيْرًا That once, Ibn Umar he saw the Prophet ﷺ making tawaf. And as he was making tawaf, the Prophet ﷺ said, How pleasant you are and how pleasant is your fragrance. 
So he's praising the Kaaba, right? The Prophet ﷺ is praising the Kaaba. That how beautiful are you? How great is your smell and your fragrance? How great you are and how great is your sanctity? And then he expressed the sacredness of the Kaaba. Everyone recognizes that the Kaaba is something sacred. It's the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the most blessed land, the most sacred land. You're not supposed to do things that are impermissible there. And even some things that are permissible aren't allowed there. Because it's a sacred place. It's a holy place. So the Prophet ﷺ then said, By the one in whose hand is Muhammad's soul, the sanctity of a believer is much greater to Allah than yours. That's a very profound statement. The sanctity of a human being, of a believer, of a mu'min, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is greater than the sanctity of even the Kaaba. And that the, the Prophet ﷺ, his wealth, his blood, and to think good of him. So in this hadith, the Prophet ﷺ is explicitly telling us that having good thoughts about another person is a right that they have upon us. So one of the rights that I have upon you is you're supposed to think good of me. And the right that you have upon me is that I'm supposed to think good of you. I'm not supposed to have unfounded suspicions or doubts. I'm not supposed to question your intentions or your sincerity. In another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالظَّنْ فَإِنَّ الظَّنَّ أَكْذَبُ الْحَدِيثِ وَلَا تَحَسَّسُوا وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا وَلَا تَتَنَاجَشُوا وَلَا تَحَاسَدُوا وَلَا تَبَاغَضُوا وَلَا تَدَابَرُوا وَكُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا إِيَّاكُمْ وَالظَّنْ Beware of suspicion. For suspicion is the worst of false tales. And don't look for the other's faults. And don't spy on one another. And don't practice najash, which was a type of sale. And don't be jealous of one another. And don't hate one another. And don't desert, don't stop talking to one another. And O oh Allah's worshippers, be brothers. And that is the advice that we should be giving not only ourselves, but every other believer that we meet. That kunu ibad Allahi ikhwana. Forget about all of these petty differences that we have. Forget about anything that we may disagree upon. And despite our disagreements, despite our, dis uh, our, our, our differences, we should always keep in mind that we are brothers and sisters of one another. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to avoid most suspicions and unfounded doubts. And then he mentions the reason why. Why are we supposed to avoid dhan? Inna ba'da dhanni ithmun. Because some suspicion, some doubt is a sin. Because some types of suspicion and doubts are actually sinful. And from this we learn that not all types of suspicion or doubts are sinful. Right? He says ba'da dhan. So that means some one is actually what? Is not sinful. Right? We learn from this that not all types of suspicion or doubts are sinful. So it's important for us to understand which ones are and which ones aren't. So in Ahkamul Quran, Imam Abu Bakr al Jassas, Rahimullah, he mentions that one falls into four categories. The first one is mandatory, it's required. This is a type of one that you're supposed to have. That you actually have to have. It's fal. It's something that you have to do. The second type of dhan is impermissible. This is the type of dhan that is completely impermissible. This is the dhan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about. The third is recommended and the fourth is permissible. Alright, so this first type of dhan is something that's required and it's actually a part of our religion. It's a part of our faith. For example, having good and favorable thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the believers. That our thoughts, our assumptions regarding our Lord and Creator are always supposed to be positive. That when we think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we think of Allah, we're supposed to think in positive terms. And the same thing applies to other believers like we talked about. That we're not supposed to question their sincerity, question their intentions, or have suspicions or doubts or make assumptions regarding them. But we're also supposed to have good thoughts of our brothers. So similarly, we're supposed to have good thoughts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To always think of Allah and the believers in a positive light. To always have hope in the mercy, forgiveness, acceptance, and grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You're not supposed to think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is angry or vengeful, or that He's punishing us, or that He will punish us. 
But rather we're always supposed to think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to forgive us, have mercy upon us, overlook our shortcomings and overlook our sins. It comes in a hadith Qudsi that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am as my slave expects me to be. So if your expectations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are that of forgiveness and mercy, then inshallah you're going to get what? Forgiveness and mercy. But if your expectations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He's testing us and He's trying us and He's putting us to difficulty and He's going to punish us, then guess what? You're going to face difficulty and hardship and life is going to seem like a punishment. Now, what does this hadith mean? Right? I am as my servant expects me to be. It means we're always supposed to have the best of thoughts regarding our Lord and Creator, the Most Merciful. To have hope and full certainty in His forgiveness. To never ever lose hope in His infinite mercy. To recognize that He's the one who forgives, accepts repentance, washes away sins, protects those in distress, and removes difficulties. I always, always think positive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jabir radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, لا يموتن أحدكم إلا وهو يحسن الظن بالله عز وجل Let none of you die unless he has good expectations from Allah That when you're passing away, when you leave this world, your expectation should be of what? Mercy, forgiveness and reward That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us paradise because of our iman and because of our faith All right. Similarly, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said Having good thoughts is from the best of worship. Having good thoughts about others, good thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best form of worship. All right. The second type of dhan, which is the one that is impermissible and prohibited, is the exact opposite of the first. It's the dhan that's being referred to in the verse. In the ba'da dhanni ithmun. The one that we're supposed to avoid and is sinful. So for example, Having negative thoughts about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And having negative thoughts about other believers So for example with respect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala It means losing hope in His mercy That we think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to show us mercy He's not going to forgive our shortcomings, our sins right? And thinking that He will punish us or keep us always in difficulty And unfortunately that's a type of attitude that some individuals have they think that every single thing that happens to them in this world that's difficult or that's wrong or that's a problem or issue is a sign that Allah is angry with them. And it's a sign that Allah is displeased with them. And it's a sign that they're being punished. But oftentimes, the opposite is the truth. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us because He loves us. Right? The closer a person is to Allah, the greater their trials and difficulties. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us these tests to actually prove our worth and prove our faith. Now with respect to other people, this dhan refers to having unfound suspicions or doubts about them. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's impermissible to have bad thoughts about other Muslims. But sometimes these thoughts and these doubts come to our mind naturally. Now if you see for example, if I see Hudayfa hanging out with a girl at the mall, what am I going to think? <laughs> right? Automatically my mind is going to go to something bad, it's going to go to some type of suspicion, some type of assumption. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he trained his companions and taught them to be careful about what they thought as well. So there's an incident that when Safiya radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, narrated, that once the Prophet ﷺ was doing i'tikaf, he was in the masjid performing i'tikaf. So I went to go visit him at night. After having spoken to him, I got up to return. The Prophet ﷺ also got up with me and accompanied me a part of the way. At that moment, two Ansari men passed by. And when they saw him, they quickened their pace. Right. So these two men from the Ansar, they were walking by and they saw the Prophet ﷺ with Safiya radiallahu anha. And obviously she was covered, they didn't know it was Safiya radiallahu anha. So they quickened their pace. So the Prophet ﷺ said to them and he stopped them. And he said, don't hurry, this is Safiya. She is Safiya, daughter of Huyay, my wife. So the two Ansari men, they were shocked. 
that why is the Prophet ﷺ stopping us and telling us that? So they said, Subhanallah, O Messenger of Allah, you are far away from any suspicion. Meaning we don't doubt you anyways. You didn't have to stop us to tell us that we had no doubts. But the Prophet ﷺ said, Satan circulates in a person like blood. As shaytan yajri fil insani majrad dam. Satan circulates in a person just like blood. I apprehended lest shaytan should drop some evil thoughts in your minds. Right? Inna shaytan yajri min ibn Adam majrad dam. Wa inni khashitu an yaqdifa fi qulubikuma sharran aw qala shay'an. So basically, next time we see someone doing something or find them in an unassuming position, we shouldn't automatically think bad of them. You're supposed to give your brother excuses, 70 excuses. But if they're apparently and obviously, you know, explicitly doing something wrong, then there's no what? <laughs> then there's no excuse. Right. Now at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us to stay away from places of doubt as well. That we shouldn't put ourselves in unassuming positions. We shouldn't put ourselves into difficulty. And we should always think that if someone sees me right now, what are they going to think? Right? So I myself shouldn't go, I don't know, let's say, go have lunch at a bar. Because if I'm sitting at the bar, what are people going to think? Huh? The, the Sheikh Saab is drinking alcohol. Right? You're not supposed to put yourselves in places where people can actually have doubts regarding you or your character. To keep ourselves out of situations that could get us into trouble. Now through this prohibition, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us how to clean our inner feelings. How to clean our thoughts, how to clean our conscience. So having this type of attitude, not being negative, not being suspicious, not being doubtful of people, it creates a clean, free of doubt, and it only, like, it creates a positive mind. Right? You're not going to constantly be worried about other people or worried about your family and your children, but you're going to be somewhat at peace, you'll be content. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, what type of attitude we should have not only towards him but towards other believers as well right why avoid most suspicions because indeed some suspicion is sinful right so that's the first prohibition of the verse the second prohibition wala tajassasu and don't spy on one another right and don't spy on one another Meaning, don't spy, investigate, or look into the hidden or private affairs of others and their faults. So every single human being, every single individual has some type of fault that they keep concealed, that they keep hidden. It's between them and their Creator. And we're not supposed to go and search for those. We're not supposed to spy on people to find out what they're doing. Now, we're not supposed to spy on people to figure out what type of sins they've been involved in. So don't seek to uncover what they've hidden and try to learn their secrets. And at tajassus, it's a very specific term that refers to seeking what is hidden from us in terms of others' faults and private affairs. Now there's another term, at tahassus. Instead of a jim, it's a what? Aha. And at tahassus is something that is very similar. It refers to going around looking for information and listening in on people's private conversations, basically eavesdropping. So tajassus is actively spying and tahassus is eavesdropping. All right, now both tajassus and tahassus are prohibited. All right, both of these things are sins, they're both equally sins and they're both things that we're supposed to avoid. The Prophet wasallam said, don't spy on one another and don't look for others' faults. لا تجسسوا ولا تحسسوا. Right. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ said, يا معشر من آمن بلساني ولم يدخل الإيمان قلبه لا تغتاب المسلمين ولا تتبع عوراتهم فإنه من اتبع عوراتهم يتبع الله عورته ومن يتبع الله عورته يفضح في بيته. The Prophet ﷺ said, يَا مَعْشَرَ مَنْ آمَنَ بِلِسَانِ وَلَمْ يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ قَلْبَهُ The O oh, people who have believed with their tongue, but belief has not entered their hearts. Don't backbite Muslims. لَا 
taqtabu and don't search for their faults for if anyone searches for their faults Allah will search for his fault and if Allah searches for the fault of anyone he disgraces that person even in his own house right so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that don't search for other people's shortcomings and faults because if you make that your occupation and you go searching for people's faults then guess what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to search for your faults and then he will expose you and he will make you feel humiliated and disgraced in your own home in another nation the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he climbed the member and said ya ma'ashara man qad aslama bi lisani wa lam yufdil imanu ila qalbi la tu'dhu al muslimina wa la tu'ayyiruhum wa la tattabi'u awratihim فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ تَتَّبَعَ عَوْرَةَ أَخِيهِ الْمُسْلِمْ تَتَّبَعَ اللَّهُ عَوْرَتَهُ وَمَنْ تَتَّبَعَ اللَّهُ عَوْرَتَهُ يَفْضَحُ وَلَوْ فِي جَوْفِ رَحْلِهِ That O oh, you who have accepted Islam with his tongue, while faith has not reached his heart, don't harm Muslims, nor revile them, nor spy on them to expose their secrets. For indeed whoever tries to expose his Muslim brother's secrets, Allah exposes his secrets wide open. Even if he were in the depth of his house. Now pay attention to these words of the Prophet ﷺ. Right, the word choice. He's showing us that there are some people who are Muslim. They are Muslim. They've testified with their tongues. They said the shahadatain. But faith has not fully entered their hearts yet. So it's possible that a person intellectually may accept Islam as the truth. Right, on a rational level. They believe Islam to be the absolute truth, right? Rationally, they believe it makes complete sense or they may have just been born with it culturally. So perhaps rationally they became Muslim or culturally they were born into Islam. They were brought up in a traditional Muslim household and just because of that they are Muslim. But faith hasn't truly entered their heart. Iman hasn't truly entered into their hearts and that's seen from their behavior. So there's this unique story regarding Umar radiallahu an. He was told that Abu Mihjan al thaqafi drinks alcohol with some of his friends at his house. So when Umar radiallahu an was the Khalifa, he was told that, hey, there's this person, he has parties at his house, and they drink alcohol there. So Umar radiallahu an went to his house, and he barged in without seeking permission, and he found that there was no one there except for one other person. So Abu Mihjan said, this is not permissible for you, right? You are Amir al-Mu'mineen, you weren't allowed to do that. You're not supposed to do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited you from spying. La tajassasu. And it said, after hearing that, Umar radiallahu anh never went back to that person's house. Even though it was known that that person used to do what? Drink in the privacy of his home. But since that was something he did in, in secret at his house, not in public, that was a sin between him and Allah. We're not supposed to do what? Go spy on them. Right? It's not our responsibility, nor is it permissible for us to go and unnecessarily look into the private affairs of others. That is not our responsibility, that's not our duty, and nor are we supposed to do that. Whatever a person does secretly in private is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will be held responsible for that. But that doesn't mean we don't try to help that individual, right? If we come to know that they're involved in some type of sin, some type of, you know, they have some type of fault or shortcoming, we should try to help them. But we shouldn't try to expose them, right? Sincere help means you help them in private, right? Oftentimes people say, I'm giving them nasiha, but they blast them in public. That's not nasiha, right? Blasting someone in public is not considered to be sincere advice. That's putting yourself up and putting that person down. Sincere advice is going to that person, calling them on the phone and speaking to them in private. Alright, so so far this verse we've discussed two of the three prohibitions. Avoiding su'udhan and the second is tajassus. The third prohibition is against backbiting. وَلَا يَغْطَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا And backbiting is generally understood to mean saying something about a person behind their back. 
in their absence that they dislike. So backbiting means to speak about someone who's not present with something that they would dislike, something that would harm them, something that would hurt their feelings, something that would make them feel bad. Right? To speak ill of another person in their absence. And since backbiting is such an important and large topic, we'll talk about it in more detail in the next session, inshallah. So, so far, up till this point, whatever we have covered in this surah makes it explicitly clear that Islam is a complete way of life. Right? Everything that has been discussed from the beginning of the surah until now, it emphasizes the fact that Islam is a total complete system, a total complete way of life. That Islam just doesn't is not only there to regulate our worship. Islam is not something that is merely spiritual. Right? Islam is something that's not there just to rectify our spiritual lives and our relationship with our Lord and Creator, but it is a total complete system, a total complete way of life. So Islam is not limited to acts of worship. And oftentimes we limit Islam to Praying, fasting, giving charity, reading the Quran, performing Hajj, giving char or, or, or doing dhikr. And obviously those things are extremely important, but that's only one aspect of Islam. Right? Worship is a huge part of it, and emphasis is on the word part. Right? Islam, again, it's a comprehensive way of life that's suitable for all times and all places. So in reality, Islam has six major six major aspects to it and this is something that's always important to keep in mind that when we think about Islam when we think about our faith our religion it has these six major aspects to it one of them obviously is aqaid the first aspect is beliefs and that is the most fundamental that's the most important what is it that makes us Muslim what is it that makes us a believer so what do we believe about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's something that we consciously have to recognize first and foremost and learn about. That what is our concept of a creator? Because our concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very different from the concept of the Jews and the Christians and other individuals. Right? Our concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be correct. Our belief regarding prophethood and messengership, our belief about the angels, the day of judgment, the scriptures, and importantly, the concept of qada and qada, right? Divine decree, divine and, and the free will of a human being. What do all these things mean? How do they work? That's what's important for us to study. Aqidah. The second aspect of Islam is worship. Al-ibadat. Praying, fasting, performing hajj, giving charity, all of these things, knowing the rules and regulations. Why do we do it? The third is the mutual dealings, transactions. Sales, business, lease, contracts, partnerships, right? Purchasing, selling, buying, import, export, all of these different mutual transactions that we have. The fifth aspect is social interactions, right? Marriage and divorce. How parents should deal with their children, how children should deal with their parents, how we should deal with our neighbors, how we deal with other people in society, how we deal with Christians and Jews and agnostics and atheists and Hindus and whoever else it may be. And the sixth aspect is purification of the soul. Tazkiyah. Making sure our hearts are pure and clean. That we cure any diseases or sicknesses of the heart that we may have. Right? And this is somewhat of a problem that we're dealing with here as Muslims in America. That a lot of times we as Muslims ourselves, we have the wrong perception of what Islam actually is. Right? And a lot of people that are struggling with their faith and struggling with their iman and are having doubts and problems, it's because of their false perceptions of what Islam is. So Islam is actually something, they never learned what Islam truly is and they have this weird perception of what Islam is, which was shaped by their what? By their own personal experiences, it was shaped by their own traditional cultural experiences in their home or with people that they interact with in the masjid or in society or other Muslims. So they don't really have knowledge regarding what Islam truly is. And part of the reason for that is because of the way that Islam has been taught. Right? Our parents or the vast majority of Muslims in America, at least our generation, were the, were the children of immigrants. So the education system of Islam wasn't really established. It has not been perfected. 
and the vast majority of us either we learned Islam through Sunday schools through Juma khutbas if if we went to these things or just at home from what our parents taught us and that's the case for the vast majority of Muslims the most they know about Islam is either what they learned from their parents who perhaps weren't that educated regarding Islam in the first place or what they learned from Sunday school which is taught by those same parents that didn't know much about Islam in the first place so obviously our understanding of Islam is going to be flawed it's going to have problems it's going to have issues and the way that it was taught that we would learn just the rules and regulations so we might know how to pray but we don't know why we have to pray and why we're praying we don't have this understanding we don't have this love of the acts of worship and why we do them and Islam again it's important Islam is rooted it's rooted in beliefs principles values and morals and these beliefs these values these principles and morals they shape our thoughts they shape our attitudes they shape our behavior these things are more important than the form of Islam right there's a spirit and then there's a form that spirit is more important focusing on the spirit of Islam is more important because if the spirit is correct automatically that translates into the form whereas if you focus on the form and you lose the spirit then things become what ritualistic you don't see the value behind it and if you don't see the value behind something eventually you're gonna give that thing up and that's a problem that you see people they do things as a ritual and eventually they see it doesn't add any value to their lives or they're not getting any value or benefit from it so they stop doing it that's why it's extremely important for us to learn these beliefs principles values and morals and internalize them and if you do that then automatically you become Muslim in the truest sense of the word and that's why this surah is so important it's teaching us what these values principles morals and ethics are so inshallah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to have a proper understanding of Islam to be people who live Islam with purpose and actually recognize what we're doing and see the importance and value of what we're doing inshallah Subhanallah bihamdihi subhanakallah bihamdik nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk